Welcome, this is NTA Tuesday Live, and I'm Cyril Stover. I'd like to apologize for starting off uh, behind schedule. Tonight, however, is one night many Nigerians would be interested in. That's talking about uh, the focus on tonight's program. Now, Nigeria has an installed capacity of 12,500 megawatts. That's of electricity, yet it generates less than 8,000 megawatts. Now, analysts attribute this fall to a number of factors, such as uh, low capacity of energy companies, estimated billing systems, outdated power equipment, inefficiency in power generation, transmission, distribution, and so many other issues, as well as sharp practices. It's believed that uh, more than 50% of power is lost from the point of power generation in the country, but government has over time embarked on various reforms and uh, power sector recovery implementation plans in getting the nation's power supply system right. Now, this many believe uh, will help in the realization of the set target of uh, achieving 20 megawatts. Well, um, and that's in just uh, a couple of years from now, hopefully. But tonight, the focus of NTA Tuesday Live would be how to move the power sector to the next level and ensure steady power supply in the Nigerian nation that will drive industrialization. But first, let's get to see this report by Usman Aliyu. The sun shines, the water flows. And the winds are blowing. These are illustrations of abundant blessings of the nature, which has been so kind to Nigeria and could have been used for electricity generation. The 40 megawatt Kashimbla hydropower project in the northeast is just one of the successfully completed projects by the government in its determination to improve electricity supply for homes and industries. There are similar projects for the generation of power and transmission, in addition to commitments towards boosting the capacity of the distribution value chain. This manifested in the efforts to rid the sector from liability, hunting the sector before privatization. Therefore, government ensures that Payment Assurance Guarantee of 701 billion Naira for the gas suppliers to have confidence and remain in business succeed. But the desire is still far away from the high hopes and expectations. This is because majority of the people in Nigeria are craving for improvement in electricity supply to support economic and social development. That hope is not all lost because the transmission chain, for instance, which is evacuating and willing the power generated for distribution, has been reinventing itself for optimal service. Here we have uh, 12 circuits. We have a four to Ogwaji. Ogwaji is in Enugu state. From power generated around here, can be as long as it enters the grid, goes to Ogwaji. From there to uh, Makodi, through to Ajakuta, to uh, Gwagwalada, and the rest of them. And here also we have two lines that are going to. It's 330 kV choosing station. Three, two to Odupani. Odupani is a generation station. So you can see that this place is, is like a, a hub of taking power that are generated around here into the grid. So this station is very important and is the second biggest 330 kV station in the, in the country. Rehabilitation and expansion work are being carried out side by side to improve performance of the existing lines, in addition to providing new ones to ensure supply improves in an efficient manner. We lost transformer in Benin, we lost in Apple, we lost in, uh, uh, in Kano, we lost in Lagos. These are capital intensive equipment and we are not taking the right step, just blame game. So the discos, the TCN, they need to improve or they need to do more of technical investment and stop the blame game. History of electric power generation in Nigeria began 123 years ago in Lagos. 
The coming of Electricity Power Sector Reform Act 2005 and subsequent privatization in 2013 could have solved the problem surrounding the sector, but still nagging questions on supply, quality and increased tariffs remain major issues in the sector. Well, that report sets the tone for tonight's discussion. Let me introduce our guests. I would like to welcome Usman Gur Mohammed, is Managing Director, Chief Executive Officer of Transmission Company of Nigeria, TCN. He's also Chairman of the West African Powerful. Welcome to NT Tuesday. Thank you, Cyril. Thank you. All right. We are also joined tonight by Zuemena Okechuku Peter, a former Executive Director, Generation of uh, the National Electric Power Authority, NEPA. Uh, he's now uh, a power generation consultant. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Cyril. Thank you, Nigerians, too. Okay. Let me also welcome to this program Dr. Vincent Dogo. He's a power sector consultant. Thanks for being here. Good evening, viewers. All right. And uh, we're also joined tonight by Hashim Ibrahim Bakuri, a former executive director of technical services, JOS Distribution Company. Let's uh, also just Welcome mention here us. that uh, he was uh, at one point in time AGM commercial services of the Abuja distribution company and uh, he happens to be the only independent member of the stakeholders advisory panel of Nigeria electricity sector industry on market uh, rules. Thanks for being here tonight. Good evening Sierra. Good evening Nigerians. All right. As we always do, we acquaint you with the procedure of this program. At the appropriate time, you can get to be part of the discussion in the studio. The various platforms will be on your screen. We advise you to take advantage of them. However, as we always say every Tuesday, for those who will be phoning in tonight, at the appropriate time, do us a favor. When your call gets through, turn down the volume of your TV set. That's the way to avoid the hurlback or the echo. Just do us that favor. As soon as your call gets through, reduce the volume of your TV set. That way it will avoid the hurlback or the echo. And the best way to know that your call has been passed through to the studio, you'll see your name appear on screen. Once you see your name on screen, it means your call is direct to the studio. So just go right ahead with your question or comment. Don't bother too much about the greetings. Just go straight to the point. Keep it short, straight to the point, so others can also get on the platform. Tonight promises to be interesting. It's all about power. So let's begin from the start of it. And we go to the MDCU of TCN as we ask this question that so many Nigerians have been asking. Yes, the unbundling of what we knew PH from, well, let's start from the days of ECN to NEPA to PHCN and then the unbundling. But Nigerians are asking, despite all these moves, power remains a major problem. What's wrong with the system? Thank you, Cyril. Um, you know, the unbundling of the power sector <coughs> took place uh, sometime in 2013, uh, which led to the privatization of distribution companies and also the gen six generation companies. Transmission company was left in the hand of government. But it was also given out to Manitoba Hydro that managed the company for a period of four years. Um, I came over from the African Development Bank as a result of the crisis that was created as a result of the management of Manitoba Hydro. That was how I came. Now, if you look at uh, the privatization that we did, honestly, we did right thing wrongly. And that's why we are slow in achieving our target. Let me give you an example. I am the chairman of West African Power Pool. Um, sometime last year, we took a decision to build the capacity of distribution companies across the value chain, that is across West Africa. We invited all the companies in West Africa, distribution companies, and they came with their KPIs. Now, when they came with their KPIs, each one of them had to demonstrate their KPIs and show what they are doing. And the KPIs was very simple. What is the level of losses that they have in their network? Uh, it will interest you to know that um, eight distribution companies in Nigeria participated. And for information also, the entire West Africa, none of the country has fully liberalized their distribution companies except Nigeria. It will interest you to know that uh, the Nigerian companies are the worst performing 
among the distribution companies in West Africa. Now, it's a universal principle. I came from private sector background since I worked in African Development Bank for nine years. It's a universal principle that private sector are more efficient than uh, public sector. So if uh, the reverse is the case here, that shows that we have made certain mistakes which we need to fix. And that is the reason why we are working on several other things. For example, when we came, we realized that TCN, that is 2017, we realized that TCN was the weakest in the value chain. So we have to do something to uh, up the game. Now, in what we did was to launch the, trans, uh, the 20 year least cost transmission expansion plan, which I can tell you, Cyril, was the first time we had this kind of study to, that took place in Nigeria. On the basis of that 20 uh, year least cost transmission expansion plan, we came up with um, the transmission rehabilitation and expansion program. Now, for us to come up with this, we had to audit TCN and establish uh, transparency because donors will not have given us money if we don't audit TCN. And for information, when we came in 2017, uh, for the four and a half years that TCN was created at that time, TCN was not audited even once. So we have to audit the place. Uh, I can assure you that uh, there are times that I sleep in the office to ensure we deliver the audit. We are able to deliver the audit and we establish the transmission rehabilitation and expansion program. Now, that program has four important deliverables. One, we work on the frequency control, which was not usually a serious, uh, uh, Nigeria has never taken it very seriously. I can tell you we achieve frequency control of 49.5 uh, and 50.5 uh, hertz from May 2017 to November 2018. What, what, what was the figure before this period? No, but the, no the, we are not even managing the frequency. We, okay. There was no management at all. Now, um, that means we work with the generator generation companies and we achieve that uh, target. Now, meaning all the generation companies, we ask them they have to be on a free governor, which was the requirement of the grid code. Now, from uh, December 23rd to May 5, 2019, we achieve frequency control of 49.8 and 50.2 hertz, which is the standard of work at 66%. Now, that tells you we are, we are on the same level with Ghana. Okay. But from May 5 to date, we are struggling with what? 30% of that uh, target. Why? Because immediately rain starts, we start having problems with the distribution network. Okay. Once it rains, the, the network collapses, and this is the problem. Okay, so yeah. we'll come to that. It's uh, yeah. something, because I certainly at about this time it might be raining somewhere, and uh, the next thing is the program. Uh, just like uh, Engineer Bakoli said, um, for transmission, we have a holistic program on how to fix the grid and make the grid a stable grid. And that's why all the segments that are supposed to fix the grid and make it work, we are working on them. Um, the four things we need to make the grid work, actually, apart from SCADA, uh, three other things are, one, we need to have frequency under control. And I've told you the, the level of frequency that we have achieved. And you know, I, said, you know, I want to tell you that I can confirm also to the viewers that um, all the generators in Nigeria now are frequency responsive. Yeah, yeah. That is where we are now. Yeah. So, so, so we have achieved that. Now we need to have a spinning reserve. I can also tell you that we have, for the first time, procured spinning reserve competitively. We provo procured 260 megawatt of spinning reserve. Now, 260 is not enough, but that is what we can get. Oh. We, but we believe that once we deploy, deploy the spinning reserve, then we'll be, able to, um, we'll be able to stabilize the grid more. And we believe that when we make it as first line charge, um, it, will, it will intensify the generators so that next time we advertise, we get more grid. Okay. Now, that's the next that's thing that's is the SCADA that you are okay. talking about. Right. Right. Now, the SCADA that you are talking about is the third thing that we need to make the grid a modern grid. Now, it will interest you, Cyril, to know that uh, in the past, we have signed three contracts for SCADA, and I, I'm sure Engineer Ozemina, who was my former boss, can confirm. And the three times, we are not successful. Now, okay. when we can... if we just explain, what is SCADA, actually? Well, SCADA is the Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition Supervisory System. Supervisory Control and, and Data, data Acquisition system, 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 yes. And it works it. with Energy Management System, which we call EMS. But all these SCADA also work on what we call communication backbone. So when Bakwadi said smart grid, smart grid means that uh, from the National Control Center, you can see all the grid, and you can see 
all the people that the players, including the generators, the transmission line, the distribution network, all you will see them from the from the from 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 from, from the national control center. All the people that are connected to the grid. That's what is smart grid. Okay. Now that smart grid will run on a communication backbone. Um, and I can tell you that the three times we signed contracts, three times we are not successful. So when we came 2017, as part of a transmission rehabilitation and expansion program, we set up a committee, and the committee review, uh, uh, the QR for that committee was, what are the three, what are the reasons why three times we tried to have SCADA, and it was not successful. Now, the reasons that I came up as the main reason why uh, we are not successful in having automation of our system is that one, we had a poor communication backbone. Then the second reason that came out was that uh, the last contract uh, wa wa was awarded without taking into account expansions that will come into the network. And that was why the expansion that came up with NIPP were not included in the, in the SCADA. And unfortunately, the SCADA was not scalable. That, 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 that was another problem. Now, the third problem that, uh, that was discovered is that there are a lot of deficiencies in the control rooms. Now, Cyril, since that time, we took a decision to ensure that we put all those things that are problem in place so that we can launch a new SCADA. And what did we do? First of all, in the Transmission Rehabilitation and Expansion Program, we have raised $1.661 billion. Part of this money are to rehabilitate existing substations because several of those substations that we are seeing have aged equipment. Some of them have not been rehabilitated for a long time, so it's to rehabilitate them. Now, all the substations that we are rehabilitating, we are digitalizing the control room and we are automating the control room so that when we come to SCADA, the issue of deficiency will not be a problem. Now, the next thing we are, we are, we are, we are doing, we, 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 do, we did, was that we launched the scoping of the, of the, of the SCADA. We employed a company called EDF. They did the scoping. When they did the scoping, they came up with the report. We decided to subject it to an international conference. We did it here last year in, in Hilton. And part of the finding of that uh, international conference is that we have to fix the communication backbone. So re it reinforced that position that we have, that the communication backbone was a problem. But unfortunately, um, our communication backbone was outsourced in 2006 to two companies. Now, the problem is that most people don't know. Every transmission line that you see, there's a fiber on it. And in fact, any new contract you sign on, on, on a transmission line, it's a must that you have to have fiber. That fiber is not for GSM. That fiber, the main objective is for the control and the management of the grid. Unfortunately, this concession did not work. It was outsourced in 2006, and this concession did not work. Now, these two concession companies are supposed to pay $40, $40 million each as a concession fee. One paid $2 million, the other one paid 3.5. Now, the next thing is that they are supposed to, the, the contract provider, they are going to invest in the network and make sure that they fix the network in a way that we can be able to use it for our communication system and use half of it for their business. Now, anywhere that the, the, the fiber goes bad, it's not all places they fix. They only fix the places that they want to do their business. The rest of them, they don't fix it. This so the contract, the contract has failed. Yes, so the contract has failed. Yes, but if, if this has come to the light, what has happened to those companies? So what we did when we came in 2017, and, uh, and, and, and we called them and we sat down with them and said, this contract has failed. Because we are not having the communication to use to do our fiber. And you also, you have refused to pay the money. So we look at the contract, and under the contract terms, it provided that if they don't pay, we can terminate. And we terminated the contracts. And uh, after we terminated the contract, if you look at what we are doing now, is that after we terminated the contract, we have launched procurement of the key communication backbone that are missing. Um, uh, the evaluation is already taking place now. I think in the next one or two weeks, we are going to solve that problem. But as I tell you, our intention is that all the problems that we have that made us not to have been successful in the past, we have to fix it. Now, part of the problem also that we need to fix is the deficiencies in the control room. Now, those areas that were, that, 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 that all those deficiencies will be fixed under the Transmission Rehabilitation Expansion Program. There are some substations we have also discovered that we are not touching them under the Transmission Rehabilitation. We have identified them. We are tendering the automation of those substations separately. 
So this is what we are doing. We have also uh, engaged a consultant to do the design of, this, uh, of, the, of the control room building. Now, what we want to do is that we have to sign the control, control room building to ensure that we have, when equipment comes, there is where we are going to keep them. Now, the next thing we are doing is that we want to send our staff to training because we have to train those staff. In fact, we are assuming zero knowledge. That is what we are assuming in general Zemina. We are assuming zero knowledge. Yeah. In fact, tomorrow, the meeting I'm going to have is that I'm going to have a meeting with some expert from ESCOM on an exchange program where we are going to send our staff, okay. maybe about 20 of them, to go and look at the automation system and work there in South Africa, maybe a, for a period of three, three months or four months, yeah. so that they, are, they, 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 they learn it. So, uh, Cyril, all the steps that we are doing, we are, we are take to make that we automate the system, we are doing it. And let me tell you, there is no choice. We have to automate <coughs> the system because if we don't automate the system, then we have a problem because we are the chairman of West African Power Pool. All small small countries like Togo, like Benin, like uh, Ghana, they have uh, automated system. We cannot synchronize with them. When we don't, uh, we don't have scatter. It's a, it's a big problem. Okay. So we have to fix let, it. let me take this to uh, 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 Zwemina and see. Look, the issue of capacity is thrown up all the time. And uh, this is a surprise to many Nigerians that this sector that has evolved over the years still cannot boast of uh, adequate capacity at this time. What happened along the line? Yeah. The truth is we have a lot of gas in Nigeria and the attraction is that since the gas is there and can be used for power generation, we should have gas power plants. Okay. That is quite good, but it's not really the best. The gas in Nigeria is located within the Delta region. Let me say the south-south, to some extent, southeast region. And when you have power plants located close to the gas supply itself, you have preponderance of power within one locality. And for you to transmit that power to distant places, you lose good quantity of power. There's loss on the line. And if there is any disturbance at all, if any major power plant you know, fails, collapses, it carries the whole system with it. Because the grid, more or less, of a power plant is within one location. But if you ha have the power plant staggered, all over the country, for instance, the collapse will be very minimal indeed. And the voltage will be much better all around the country. So the idea of uh, having so many gas power plants is good because the power, I mean, the, 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 the gas is there, but it is not really the best. You see, we have overlooked other modes of power generation that could have helped us a lot. Renewable energy, which includes water, solar, wind, biomass, and all that, you know. These are areas that if we really generate power from, we can do that from different locations of the country, you know, and then stabilize the grid by locating the power plants, you know, at, you know, staggered places, quite distant from one another to sustain the grid, you know. So I think the problem is, even though the power plants are there, it's been mentioned here, the gas is not readily available. Okay. Even if you have all the fund now, and you ask a gas company, any of these gas companies to give you gas, Shell, IGP, and all that, it will take them not less than three good years. Even if you give them all the money, 100%, it will take them not less than three years to do the aggregation of gas and send to you. So I think we need to really go into uh, solar, wind, Hydro, hmm. you know, to sustain the system. Otherwise, we, 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 we are really putting all our eggs in one basket. Okay. Yeah. Well, speaking about hydro, yeah. um, ironically, it's a, you know, uh, power generated from <laughs> water driving yes. turbines. Yes. But again, there's a joke, Dr. Dugo, it's all over the place that Nigeria's power supply system is allergic to water. <laughs> Meaning, the minute you find rain clouds there, power goes off. What could be the reason for that? <laughs> you, you're a consultant in this. <laughs> All right. Talking about uh, once the clouds are gathering, suddenly when you are watching TV in your house, then the light simply goes off. Actually, 
Nigerians can pre predict rainfall without looking at the clouds these days. <laughs> All you need is to sit in your house, and once you hear your window creaking and the lights goes off, you know surely the rain is already falling. In fact, you can predict how long the rain can fall. Anyway, that shouldn't be the case. I think either there is a deliberate attempt here that within the value chain, we have addressed that matters must be addressed holistically. If one part of this value chain is not delivering at its best or average or optimal, then whether you make efforts in generation, you make efforts to fix the transmission, then this will amount to zero. Honestly, I think there must be an interface principle or methodology, a kind of monitoring mechanism to ensure that each part player plays its role. But in this quest, honestly, the distribution companies have not done much. Judging from the way they distribute this power to available customers, the technical losses are surmounted and nothing is being done. I don't think since privatization, any effort has been done primarily by these distribution companies to fix the problem. And I think government needs a deliberate policy directives on how to improve on that. But you do have a regulatory body. And uh, by the way, we should just mention there that we had also asked that the uh, uh, Electricity Regulation uh, Commission, we had also asked them to come on this uh, program. We hope they might just make it before we round off. So you do have a regulatory body. And where companies are not performing, why are they getting away with it? Well, there are KPIs the regulator put in place to monitor performance. Uh, monthly, they file their reports on their operations. However, what the customer wants to see, as you said, is reality. Once the distribution licensee does not maintain his lines, maybe trace clearing or the wires itself and the pole supports, we will continue to have problem of line stripping. And if it is spontaneous, for example, in a large area, in most cases, it pulls down the grid. So any distortion or any problem to just one part of it is capable of... It's affecting. already a weak okay. and, I will say, obsolete network. All right. Well, um, the phone lines are open. We'll return to you in just a moment. Uh, do we have our first caller on this program tonight? All right. We have uh, Kenneth calling in. Oh, well, we've lost that call, I do understand. But just, uh, I, I, I know on a night like this, the calls will just be coming through. Okay? Now we have Ada calling in from Joss. Hello. Ada from Joss, are you with us? Oh. Well, challenges with the phone system just like challenges with the power system <laughs> so <laughs> we hope we'll fix that but then these companies everyone had thought that once the discos had been privatized and uh, like the MD said uh, it's and it's always been said that the private sector can and has the capacity to perform better but Nigerians are asking in fact some Nigerians say look it was even better before privatization than it is now sure yeah. Well, <laughs> you, you, you can say that, but it depends if you have done a study on that or not. Mm -hmm. uh, when the new investors took over, I'm not uh, uh, vouching for them, because yes, I mean, they need to be here and they yes, were invited, maybe they didn't come. There were things that they are supposed to have done, and there were things the regulator is supposed to have done with respect to tariff for them with respect to investment. However, they have been, will I say, carried away to payments of takeover loans instead of investing. They have been carried away on looking for reflective tariff. 
which they have been hammering right from takeover to date, while their performance with respect to collection has not gone beyond what the former government workers were collecting, also their corporate governance with respect to transparency of operations. If you collect, for example, 10 Naira, and the market has given you 3 Naira as your own portion of the collection, you are supposed to remit back 7 Naira to the value chain, up to the gas man. And you didn't do that, you are holding on to 5 Naira. Then you send 5 Naira for the others. Certainly you are bringing distortion in the market. The gas man will restrict gas supply to the generators. That is one of the fundamental problems. They also have issues to do with access to capital. Because their books are not, I mean, enticing to the banks, nobody is willing already to give loan to them for expansion. These are issues that I said are multifaceted and have to study it uh, holistically. I don't know if I can say something right, about sure. this because I had the opportunity of working with CPS of, CPCS of Canada, who was a transaction advisor over the privatization. I did the audit of all the power plants in Nigeria for CPCS, you know, based on which the power plants were assessed for sale. And I want to let you know the some of the defects in the privatization process. You see, the method adopted, you know, for the privatization, to me, it wasn't actually the best way it would have been done. These distribution companies, and even generation companies, had little time to see the facilities they were to buy. Little time indeed. They had about three hours in a hotel where the line diagrams of each, as they are today, each disco, the whole each disco, the line diagram was placed in a hotel, whether in Enugu or Abuja or somewhere, wherever, whichever you're interested in. You go there and look at those line diagrams for three hours and you go. So what most of them did was to take photographs of those line diagrams because there was no time for them really to study it. Took it away. Whatever they could get from it, I don't know. And many of them, too, believe that, you know, um, there was so much money. Right. You know, so they believed they were going to collect much money, too. But they didn't reckon with the investment they ought to make, they would make, to make such money. They didn't. Unfortunately... What about the competencies of those companies? I was, no, I'm I coming to that. I'm coming to that. <laughs> There are standards set by government for them for quality and quantity of staff. Like he said, there were KPIs also set out. This metering, for instance, some of them won their own uh, uh, discos because of the timeline they gave to improve the system, to remove the problems in the system. This metering, some of them said within two, three years, mm -hmm. they would have metered the whole network within their disco. And today, metering is today, a big issue. Today, I'm sure even 30% not metered. Mm -hmm. you know, so the, the, the process really was not totally, it was not total in a way for both governments and the interested companies to know, go through the full hog and know what was involved. So they took it over really without understanding. Because they were hopeful they were going to make money. money. But uh, they didn't know they were going to spend good money too, you know? So the, the competencies of those companies, and um, you know, Nigerians have spoken about this and said, look, there are many who will tell you they don't believe that all those companies that, you know, bought what was a bundle, they don't believe they had the requisite competencies to do that. Frankly speaking, surreal, talking about the competence, I personally doubt whether the current owners of the discourse did, up initial, had the requisite competency. Mm -hmm. Don't forget that 
up initial from the EPSR Act, there were clearly, clearly that there were dimensions that were well clarified that set the criteria for this privatization. And there were indications or indices to which each company that was to participate should at least possess certain level of competency. But when we began the roadshow, some of us within the system then drew the attention of the government because I remember vividly I was part of the team. I was called to be part of the CSP, uh, of CPCS, Canada, CPCS yeah. Uh, yeah. advisors. And I told the minister then that I have never seen in the whole world how you can go to sell an asset that you don't know the value about. It was at the advent on that that horridly an evaluation was put together. So how did the government come about evaluating the distribution companies they had on ground? This is a question that needs to be answered. Secondly, the people that participated, the criteria were lowered. And eventually what we ended up with are people that do not, I will repeat, the current owners of the discourse do not possess the technical competency. Otherwise, up initial, they would have known the magnitude of what was on ground. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Cyril. Um, I, I think it's a chicken and egg thing because uh, if you look at what is happening, uh, you will see that there's also some aspect of actions that government is supposed to do. You know, for a business to be run in a regulated environment like this, there are so many things that need to take place. Oh, okay. You need to have a regulatory, I mean, certainty. All right. You and have to have a regulatory certainty. Means they have to have cost reflective tariff, okay. which is supposed to be a driver of how they raise their capital. Hmm. But uh, just like uh, the people who are actually participating in the privatization, I cannot question them because they, are, they work with the company that actually did the privatization. But uh, I can tell you from transmitting transmission point of view, as I said, the value chain, you see the value chain is like this. If this transmission doesn't perform, it bankrupts distribution and, and generation. If generation doesn't uh, perform, the distribution company and transmission are bankrupt. That is how it is. Okay. If the distribution company doesn't collect the money, no other okay. gets money. So this is how it is. So as we are focusing on transmission rehabilitation and expansion program, as I said, as at now, I'm not saying we have fixed all the problem in transmission, but we have raised enough money to put N minus one across the country. All the lines that are radial, we are fixing it. All the places where we have weakness like Alauji, Uweri, Iyala, Onicha Line, uh, Kano, Kaduna, uh, Shiroro, uh, 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 Kaduna, all those lines we are fixing them. We are fixing them. It's a matter of timeline. Now, look at the problem, Cyril. When we did this simulation, we also simulated the investment requirement of the discourse. Because as at now, out of the 737 interfaces we have the discourse, only 400 and and, 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 and 21 have full protection. Yes. The remaining 317, uh, you have 177 where lines are radiated directly from, from TCN uh, yeah. switchyard. That means our 33 kV lines, our, our 33 kV breaker is the primary breaker to supply 415 customers for 177 feeders across the country. Now, you have also a situation where 139 are a breach of this injection substation, and there's none. NEMSA came up with a, a report recently and said that they have banned the use of 33 kV to supply 415 customers. But how do you enforce the ban? Mm -hmm. You cannot enforce the ban if we don't have money to fix yeah. those, right. uh, those problems. Uh, now, we simulated the grid, uh, the, the, the requ investment requirement of the discourse, and we have come up with $4.3 billion. That is the investment, of the investment requirement of the whole discourse. Okay, we'll ask you to pause there. $4.3 billion. We'll ask you to pause. We'll return to you and see how that money can be put into this. But we do have a caller who's been waiting on the line for quite a while. Kenya, is this still there? Hello? Is Kenya still there? Good evening. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I think I have to appreciate you so much for the program of this kind. And uh, this has been a problem in Nigeria for quite a long time now. And um, you see, uh, privatization, when it came to Nigeria, uh, we discovered that uh, that is the total failure in the power sector, uh, where 
the power sector has been given to some recycled politicians uh, to manage power. Uh, Siri, I want to tell you something here straight away that um, in Nigeria, for instance, individuals cannot manage power where we have a population of about 200 million and where politics has been playing in every sector, in everything. It's quite unfortunate. Uh, we have a diluted leadership right from time to when democracy returned in Nigeria in 1990, uh, 1999. Uh, President Olusegun Obasanjo then, uh, they have the privilege of putting these things in the right perspective. The National Assembly, people who were chairing those committees, and, uh, and some individuals who were in charge, who were supposed to put the power sector in the right perspective. They have failed us. Look at what we're going through today. Uh, estimated billion across the country. You don't, you pay for what you don't consume. It's quite unfortunate. We talk about these things every day. I appreciate you so much for, uh, for, for, for bringing this topic up. We talk, we talk, and then over the radio, televisions, in newspapers, but nothing seems to be changing. What are we supposed to do? If you ask me today as a Nigerian, it, it, we don't even supposed to bring people outside. But I want to tell you that the best people that can manage power supply in the country, they are foreigners. If you can bring in China, Chinese, Chinese people here, give them time, I, I, I promise you, I think you're going to have the best of it all. But every day, we bring in people, the, the same people that bought this from the government, they're the same people who are <coughs> in the government, controlling this. They have a target. Maybe a, a particular distribution uh, unit has been given a set of about 50 million naira, And then, then themselves, go about uh, trying to meet up with that 50 million naira, but trying to add up something of, about, about what they are going to have in their pocket. I want to tell you something here in Makuri where I reside. It is worse. Uh, some of the test three KV line have passed here. People are not using it. But they have been charging us. We, we use power. I mean, we pay for power for what we don't even consume. This is really, really bad. I challenge the federal government and I challenge whoever people who, who are in charge of these units, that they should sit up to the task. If they want to help Nigeria, let them change their attitude. Let them do what is right. We are going down through, I mean, today, economically, it's because of the failure of power supply in the country. Some other neighboring countries who have actually get I mean, power supply from Nigeria, they are doing better than us. We are here, you know, almost every day we, we talk about this, and then band us. Why are we not producing security for all these things? This is our country. We have almost everything. There's nobody who come outside the country and then to do all those things for us. Please, I uh, appeal to all Nigerians, the leadership of this country, and people who are controlling power in the country. Let them sit up to the, the, to the responsibilities, I mean, to the task ahead of us. We, we generate a lot of what we talk about. We generate 27,000. But what you think power, we, we, I mean, I mean the, 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 what we, we are using within the country is below 7,000. This is really bad for a population of about 200 million. Industries are not even prevail. As I speak to you, we don't have any industry in Makodi, in Benue State, that uh, uh, runs up because of power failure. People who cannot come in, the foreign investors cannot come in because we don't have this. Thank you very much, and God bless Nigeria. All right, thank you very much, John. Good easily have been speaking for millions of Nigerians. <laughs> Good I think you have spoken to Oh, sure. Yes. But let's go back to the investment. now. People have said maybe the way out is to recapitalize or inject funds. But again, some Nigerians say, look, the discourse came at some point in time and uh, they got money and there was little or no improvement. So are we going to throw money at it again? Uh, thank you, uh, Cyril. I think uh, this is the position of Transmission Company of Nigeria. Because if we continue to expand the grid as we are doing, and we don't have commensurate investment in the, in the distribution network. It means that uh, we, our investment is not sustainable. I also want to tell you that uh, contrary to what the last caller has said, that there's no, comp there's no change. There's a significant improvement that has been recorded under this government. You know, don't forget that uh, transmission company was the weakest link in the value chain. Today, we are not only, we have not solved all our problems, but we are even driving some of the changes that are in the sector. We have also have uh, raised investment. We have changed the procurement system under which uh, all those containers are left in the port. And under this government, we rediscovered, we, we made 800 containers stranded in the port. Cyril. Some of these containers have been there for over 15 years. Some of them have been auctioned. We have removed 775 containers out of the 800 containers, as at last week. So it's not that uh, nothing has happened. We have also expanded the grid through the use of TCN staff 
So, you know, TCS staff are the best engineers you have in the country. Sure. Very patriotic. We use them to expand the network. There is no region that we have not put more than five power transformers across the region in the last two years. And this was done under this government. And we have read raised $1.661 billion in expanding the grid. We have changed the procurement process in such a way that weak companies and companies that have been failing cannot win contract here. But the question is that, if you look at generation also, in general, I mean, you know, as a grid administrator, we are the one that are stopping generators from coming to the grid anyhow. What is the reason? The reason is because that uh, what we have, we cannot take. Electricity, you cannot store it. You can only generate what you can consume. Sure. You, you understand? Yeah. You, so you cannot store it. So as at now, the biggest link that we have problem with is the distribution network. And we don't have plan. So generators that are coming in, you don't allow them to be coming in so that you have a stranded generation. Because every generation that we have that we are not consuming, we are paying for it. Yeah. So why should you continue to expand the generation when you don't have, uh, you, you are not taking? So we are saying that government actually, from transmission point of view, government was supposed to be a passive player in the sector. That is why uh, the, the, the directors of the distribution companies, only one is the government with 40%, while the discourse have uh, six uh, uh, directors. But we are saying, no, since we have this issue, there's no more issue of, uh, of, uh, of uh, government being a, 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 a seat on the side. Government have to bring their own 40% out of this $4.3 billion that we have raised. That we have we have estimated, and the owners of the distribution company should come with this money also. We are also saying there has to be a regulatory certainty under which you are going to have the tariff that are going to be in place to support this investment. We are also saying, just like transmission, we have achieved competitive procurement of our service. Everything we are buying TCN, you will see it on the on the on the newspaper. We don't buy things under the table. So everybody, every player, consistent with the directive of ECOWAS that was approved December 2018, all value chain must do competitive procurement of their services mm -hmm. so that you don't raise this capital and somebody will come and be awarding contract under the table and, and finish okay. the money. Now, Cyril, whether we like it or not, um, we have to pay for the services to ensure that things improve. All right. But we'll we have to be serious and we cannot be playing games. Right. We'll return to that. Yes, Let's yes. Uh, get this other call from Zaria. May Toma call it in from Zaria. Hello. Good evening, sir. Good evening. See, so it's unfortunate we are talking about power in Nigeria. I am a young person, see, so, but I have not been on power for all my life. That we don't even have jobs. There is not a good government in this country, most, most especially about power. There is not to talk about power. They are just saying, what? What's here? Because we have been discussing so many times. So many times. The only time the other time was thinking about it. This was in power, but they did not speak about it. at all. We don't even point fingers. We are just about the power issues. So instead of getting yeah. jobs also in factories yeah. yeah. in some way yeah. that we yeah. are yeah. it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. We don't know who to blame. All right. I hope I hope this government has seen this thing. So that they will, they will go back to the drawing board and solve this problem once and for all. It's unfortunate, up till now. Okay, we don't even know who to blame. We don't know where to point fingers at. Ever since we were small boys, we used to hear this thing over and over again. Everybody we have come to disappoint us. All right. It's unfortunate. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Waitama. Well, I uh, could get make out some of what he's just said there, the frustration. Mm -hmm. says he's a young man who has not experienced a uh, <laughs> steady <laughs> power supply <laughs> so far. There are so many young people who tell you they can't remember yeah. when, when they last had uh, yeah. 247 power supply, uh, supply. But at this point in time, we'll take a short break. When we return, we'll consider what steps to take 